So today I'm going to talk to you about nature. This is an x-ray of a femur bone. And you can see that the bone isn't solid. As people, we're like vehicles, we're like cars. The heavier we are, the more energy we have to use. So if we had solid bones, we'd be very heavy. We'd be evolutionary, quite inefficient. So we'd have to move our bodies around. We'd use more fuel to move, and we'd use more fuel to feed our cells. So what nature does is it actually makes us porous. You can see here that the bone has some areas which are quite dense and other areas which are more porous. So along the femur head, where there's a load coming from your hip bone down the femur stem, there's actually a bit more dense bone. This is stronger because it has to be able to withstand the loads coming down from your body. In other areas, this is not the case. So you actually have porosity. You have areas where the bone is much more porous because there's not actually much going on. So nature is very efficient, but how can we be inspired and how can we make use of this natural and very um, evolved design in designing everyday products? Well, we need two things. We need a manufacturing technique that allows us to build things in such a way, but also we need software and design tools that are able to react and respond just like nature does to what products need to be able to do. So, this is a video I've taken of what's commonly known as 3D printing. It's a method of growing objects from the ground up. It's an additive manufacturing technique. Here you can see a laser actually melting, layer by layer, a very thin amount of powdered nylon, or actually this is titanium. Another layer then goes on top, and the laser then continues to melt. By doing this layer-wise process, you can actually grow real solid objects within a machine, and in a matter of hours, you then end up with a real product. So you can see the laser actually filling and melting the layers of um, powdered titanium. And here in this final scene, you can see what we ended up building. And these are actually tools for golf balls. So, this is the manufacturing technique. How do we design it? Well, we've worked on some solutions that are very inspired by nature. And what we can do is we'll take an object and we say, what does this object really have to do? Well, this area has to withstand some sort of very large load, whereas this other area is not really doing much. So we can replace big, solid masses with such structures that are kind of lattice-like, very much like the internal structures of bone. We can make them very porous, and we can also make them a lot denser as well. So here in this animation, you can see a very porous lattice, but it actually get much thicker if needed to be stronger. It uses more material, but maybe it needs to. Now you can localize that, so now you can see emerging in the center a density concentration where you, you would potentially have to withstand larger loads there. Now the transition between where you have to be strong or where you can be porous can be quite smooth as well. So you don't have two materials, let's say plastic and metal joined together, where you have a transition that's either over-engineered or is actually a point of weakness. Instead, you have a smooth gradation built with just one material that can behave like multiple. Now you can change how this works. So you can change what's known as a topology or the way that this thing is interacting so that you can have different mechanical properties. Now I'm going to show you a short video of some software in action. Uh, this is a cantilever beam. And over here, what we have is a solid object. And this solid object has to be able to withstand the loads of being um, attached in one location while actually stressed and pulled in another direction. Um, this is a visualization of what a lattice would then look like. Over here, you can see um, it's actually made in one piece. It's a very organic looking structure. You can have different shapes, and these can be made in different materials. So over here, I have one manufactured in solid stainless steel. It's fully self-supporting, manufactured in one piece. Whereas here, we have a similar design, this time built in nylon. 
These can have different mechanical properties. So the one on the screen there and the one next to it, these are actually very good um, for what's known as osseointegration. This is the infusion of bone cells into such structures because this actually, because it looks very bone and porous-like, you can use this for uh, medical implants and you can use this to then infuse existing bone cells into such structures. Now, let's look at some practical examples. This is um, an engine block. It's a standard chunky bit of metal, and all it's really doing is you have two inputs of fluids coming in from the top and then joining together and coming out the side. Now, there's a lot of material used there, and the way you'd normally do this is you'd have a big solid piece of metal, you'd drill through the front, drill through the sides, hope the two meet, and you end up with your part. Now, what we do instead is we grow such structures. So you can put this through our software, and we have to analyze this to ensure that there's an internal pressure that can be withstood within the pipe and a uniform pressure on the top. So what we want to do is see whether we can design something that can be functional but use less material. Now, here's the lattice structure that was designed by the software to withstand the internal pressure within the pipes but we also have to be able to create structures that will withstand the pressure along the top as well. And what we end up with is a design like this. Now, here's the physical part here, again, made in stainless steel in one piece, and this now only uses 22% of the material of the original solid. Now, there's something in aerospace known as the buy-to-fly ratio. This is the amount of raw material that's bought that actually ends up flying. And typically in aerospace, this is around 10%. So you buy this much titanium, by the time you chop some up, drill some holes and do whatever else, only 10% of that actually ends up flying. You have 90% material wastage. With additive manufacturing, you're 95%. So only the, the powdered titanium that's used is melted and that's then in the part. The rest of the titanium, you just shake off the powder, put it back in the machine, and it can reuse. Now, we also worked on heat exchangers. These are essentially radiators that are used to cool fluids within cars, and you can have inputs that can be snaked around, and you can have very efficient, complex structures manufactured in one piece. This part, in fact, within the tubes that the fluid runs through, we have what are called turbulators. Um, when you have fluid running through a pipe that's being cooled, the cool fluid tends to stay around the outside and the hot fluid continues through the middle, not actually being cooled. So by putting an obstacle course within the tubes, you actually cause turbulence and you improve the efficiency of the heat exchanger. And we're able to actually in one piece manufacture tubes with such obstacle courses inside. Again, this whole part can be manufactured this time in aluminium in one piece with essentially 100% material usage, no material wastage at all. Now, this part was actually for a Formula One car, and what we can do is, you want to have a, quite a large heat exchanger, but Formula One cars are quite small, so you don't always have big square blocks of volume to put a heat exchanger in. You might have an awkward corner around the back. So what we can do is virtually take the elements of our heat exchanger, replicate them to fit that volume, print them, and then just put it in place, and it fits perfectly. Now, this is another project we've been working on. This is customized high heel shoes. Here, we scan someone's uh, 3D feet shape, and then we put PDAR sensors that measure their pressure hundreds of times a second on five-inch heels and ask them to walk on a treadmill. Here, what we're doing is creating customized midsoles with additive manufacturing that, again, like the bone, vary in thickness and in density. Now, this is just a visualization of where the pressures are. So people have different pressures. Everyone walks differently. Some people walk on their heels. Some people walk on their forefoot. And what we can do is create customized cushioning for everyone to give them the most comfortable experience. Now, this is a photo of a typical midsole. It's made of about five or six different materials. This requires assembly, labor, and from a recycling point of view, it's very difficult because it has to be torn up into its uh, different pieces. What we can do is replace that with this. This is a 3D printed nylon midsole manufactured in one piece with variable densities. So in some areas you get the cushioning you require, in other areas you get the stiffness and you get something that actually looks a lot like bone. And this is the part um, assembled within the high heel shoe. 
Now, other things we've been working on include um, medical implants. So we've taken inspiration from bone, we've gone all the way around, and now we can actually create customized orthopedic implants. This, this photo here is actually of finger implants. If you ever break your fingers, or if you want to be a bit like Wolverine, you could actually put these in your hands. And what happens here is that porous surface there with the holes, this is for bone ingrowth. You put that into your bone, and the bone cells, because it has the right pore size and strut thickness, they grow into that and they fuse into the implant. So you get a really strong fusion between a titanium implant and your bone. Now, other medical devices include cranial implants. Now, everyone has a different shaped head, and if you're going to need a cranial implant, a crack is very likely to be a different shape to someone else's crack as well. So customized implants here are very important. What we can do um, is actually manufacture by scanning the crack in virtual um, software, create the exact curvature and create um, customized cranial implants in a material called PEAK. This is a plastic material. And then we can then insert it into the right place. We've done tests to show that you get nice uh, bone infusion into such parts, and this is what it would essentially look like. Now, the great thing here is that you don't end up with a simple uh, metal plate in your head. You actually get full bone ing regrowth back into that structure, so essentially, other than the plastic part remaining, you get your bone cells fusing back into place. Uh, the most popular implant um, that we've been working on is called an acetabular cup. This is essentially a hip bone implant, and here is a screenshot of the software trying to optimize a design and analyze how the part gets stressed, and we end up designing a part like this. Now here's a, uh, the physical part. Again, it's made in titanium, and this structure here on the surface starts to look a lot like bone now, but this is actually designed in software. Every little hole there, every little beam there is actually exists in 3D CAD. It's not there by accident, it's actually been put there um, structurally. So this is great, Burns love this, so we're, we're actually um, in trials to get this onto the market. Um, the final uh, medical part I'm gonna show, um, this one's interesting, it actually looks like um, Saruman's Tower from Lord of the Rings. Um, but this is actually um, a tibial tray, this is a knee implant. So you put this, you hammer this into your uh, tibia bone, and then your knees go onto this bearing surface along the top. And what we have here, again, is that very porous structure. This is made in titanium, and you can get full bone ingrowth into this part. Now, just to finish off, um, and seeing kind of where this is heading now, because all of this is happening right now. Um, we've recently worked on a project uh, with a company called Made in Space, or associated with NASA, um, in actually getting 3D printing onto spaceships. And the idea here is that instead of assembling parts on the ground, putting them in the spaceship, taking them up, and then creating a space station, why not take the raw material and actually print or build the parts when you need them? So you can have spare parts if something breaks, but you can also extrude entire uh, space frames out into space. So we've actually rigged um, a 3D printer, and we're able to extrude this structure, which is very specific. It provides cushioning in one direction, but in the other direction is very stiff. So if you can extrude this for almost kilometers out from the spaceship, in theory, you could have a place for space shuttles to dock, but have a little bit of cushioning um, when they come into impact. What you can also do is build with multiple materials, so you can have the electric power actually being printed as it runs through the structure, and you can also have the fuel running through the same thing as well. Now, I want to finish off the presentation by showing you a video of this part in action. This was actually printed at zero gravity um, only a couple of months ago, and this is a NASA astronaut standing on this 3D printed part. He's currently at two Gs, so he's about, so it's twice his weight, about, probably about 160 kilograms on this part. Uh, gravity slowly reduces and reduces. Now they've finally got to zero gravity, and you can see the part starts to float, and you end up with a 3D printed part built in space that is obviously very, very lightweight. And that's it, thank you very much.